And now the conclusion of Math 105, final exam review. Statistics. For number 33, we're going to find the five number summary and the mean, and then create a box plot. All right, here's our data set. Let's find the mean first. So we need sigma x, the sum of all the data. Add all those up, we get 812. And then for the mean, x bar, sigma x over the number of data values. Here we got 11 data values, so n equals 11. So that gives us 812 divided by 11, or 73.8. Is the mean. And now we need the five number summary. So that's going to be the minimum value, 46, the maximum, 99. Now we need Q1, Q2, Q3. So the median first, Q2. Let's find the middle value. We have 11 values, so that means right in the middle. One, two, three, four, five. Sixth value over. We got five to the left, five to the right. So 79 is Q2. All right, now from 79, we're gonna, we have split the data into two pieces, two equal pieces. We have five data values over here. Now we find the median of these five. The middle value is 55. Since we have an odd number, we just point right to 55 there. Here we have five on the right, so another odd value. So that means you can go right to the middle value, which is 87. So there is Q1, Q2, and Q3. Now we have all the numbers we need for the box plot. So usually I start these in the middle. 79. All right, we'll have that line going up the middle. And then we go out to 55 on the box. All right, there's Q1 at 55, Q2, and then Q3 at 87, which is right about here. And there we go. The values of Q1, Q2, and Q3 give us the box. And then we use the lines to extend out to the maximum and the minimum. So there's the box plot. Now for 34, we're going to find the 25th percentile of the data set. So we're going to use this equation here. I equals K over 100 times N plus 1, where K is the percentile and N is the number of data items. So K is 25. We have 11 items plus 1, so that gives us 0.25 times 12, which is 4. So that means I is 4. Now, does that mean the 25th percentile was 4? No. It means the 25th percentile is the fourth data item. So we need to count from the left. 1, 2, 3, 4. 61. So you have the 25th percentile is 61. Now we want to find the percentile for 87. All right, so we use a different equation for this one. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see is people mixing up these two equations. Now in this equation, x represents the number of data items to the left of 87. So we'll find 87, and we'll count the number of data items to the left of it. We don't include 87. All right, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eight data items. So it gives us 8 on top. Now, y represents the number of times 
the E7 occurs in the list. Well, it's just one. So 8 plus 0.5 over n is 11 times 100. All right, multiplying all this out. Eight point five over eleven times one hundred gives us seventy-seven point two, and then round this value to the nearest whole number, and that is the seventy-seven percentile for eighty-seven. Next up, Z scores. Number 36. So when we're calculating Z scores, we're going to use this equation here. The Z score is the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. The first one, the mean of the data set is 35. All right, so there's the mean, x bar is 35, and the standard deviation is 5. So we can plug those in, 5 for the standard deviation, 35 for the mean. We want to find the z-score for the value 23. All right, the value goes in for x, so we got 23 minus 35 over 5. All right, evaluate the top first as negative 12, so the z-score is negative 12 over 5, which is negative 2.4. So that means 23 is 2.4 standard deviations below the mean. 37. Joanna scores 89 on an exam, which has a mean of 81 and a standard deviation of 6. How many standard deviations above the mean is her score? Well, that's exactly what z-score tells us. So we just calculate the z-score for this. So Joanna's score was 89, so that's the individual item there, minus the mean of 81, divided by the standard deviation of 6. So that gives us 8 over 6. So z is, we can round this to the nearest tenth, 1.3. So that means Joanna's score is 1.3 SDs, standard deviations, above the mean. So I have a very good score for Joanna. Next up, expected value. For number 38, we're going to find the expected value. We've got a table listing outcomes and probabilities. The expected value equation. And we're going to take the value, multiply it by the probability for each case, for each outcome, and then add them all up. So in this case, the first outcome is 10.2. So that's the value. 10.2 times the probability, 0 0.23, plus second outcome, 25.1, times 0 0.6 for the probability, plus the next outcome is 30.7, times 0.12 for the probability, plus 36.5 is the outcome, 
times 0 0.05 for the probability. Multiply all that out, add it up, and we get 22.9. So 22.9 is the expected value for 38. Now in 39, we've got a card game. Player randomly selects one card from only the 13 spade cards, so no other suits in the deck. If the player draws an ace, the player wins $7. Now there's only one ace in a suit. So that means the probability, the value, the first value is seven dollars. And the probability is one out of thirteen. One ace out of thirteen cards. Next value, draw a king, queen or a king, it's three dollars. So you win three dollars for a queen or a king. Well, there's one queen, one king, two cards total. So that's two out of 13 for that probability. Next up, a jack, you win $2. There's only one jack in each suit. So one out of 13 for that one. And finally, any other card, the player loses a dollar. So negative a dollar for the value. And any other card, well, we have 13 cards. And we got four here, so that's nine left. So there's nine cards where we lose a dollar. All right, now this is what we'll use then for the expected value calculation. So EV will be seven times one thirteenth plus three times two thirteenths plus two times one thirteenth plus the last one. Uh, negative one is the value, so negative one times nine thirteenths. I'm going to multiply these then, you get seven thirteenths for the first fraction, you get six thirteenths for the next one, two thirteenths for the next one, and then I'll just change this to subtraction minus eight one times nine gives us minus nine thirteenths. Now if we add up all these, add up all the numerators, we get six. So the expected value is six out of 13. And if you divide that out, we get 0.46. And since we're talking about a game with money, Expected value, every time you play, you can expect to win 46 cents. So this would be a great game to play. Next up, probability rules. We're going to calculate the probability of compound events. Compound events are made up of more than one simple event. Number 40. You got a jar, you got three red. Two blue, four green, and six yellow marbles. If one marble is randomly selected, determine the probability that either a red, red or a green marble is selected. All right, let's find the size of the sample space, which, in other words, is the total number of marbles. 6, 4, that's 10, 15. Right, so we have 15 marbles. All right, so we're going to use the probability R for red, G for green.
Now these are mutually exclusive events, which means we cannot both pick a red and a green. So that means we don't have to use the formula of the version where we subtract uh, the probability of red and green. So a simpler version on this one, so that's nice. All right, now the probability of red would be a number of ways we can get a red. So there's three reds, so there's three different ways we can get a red, divided by the size of the sample space. So three out of 15. That's the probability of just a red. Now with green, we got four greens. So the probability of getting a green is 4 out of 15. Add them together, and we get 7 out of 15. And that's the probability of getting a red or a green. And if you want to express that as a decimal, 0.47. So about a 47% chance of getting either a red or a green. Number 41. Got a dice game. Got a six-sided die. And an eight-sided. What's the probability of rolling one or two on the first die and then rolling an even number on the second die? Now notice the first one is an or, red or green. Now we're going to do an and. We need both of these. So probability, and I'm going to make up a couple of events here. Let's call T to be the probability of being a one or a two on the first. And then for the second one, probability of E probably going to be an even number on the second time. Now the result of rolling second die is independent of the result on the first die. Which means we don't have to use the conditional probability equation. All we have to do is multiply them together. All right, we're using the equation for independent events. So the first one, probability of t, we have Number of ways we can get t over the size of the sample space. So we have one or a two, so two ways we can get the numbers we want, and it's a six-sided die, so there's two over six. And now the probability of e. Probability of E, we want even numbers on the second die. Now that's an eight-sided die, so there's two, four, six, eight. So that's four even numbers out of eight. So that's four out of eight for the second one. Now multiply these fractions out. And we got eight over 48, and that reduces to one sixth. And if you wanted to express that as a decimal, we'd get 0 0.17. So there's about a 17% chance of rolling a one or two on the first die, and then an even number on the second die. And that concludes today's mini series. Hope you all have a great day and best of luck on the final.